Good afternoon. My name is Mark Baldessari, and I'm the President and CEO and Director of the PPIC Statewide Survey at the Public Policy Institute of California. Thank you for joining us today. I welcome you to our first virtual program today featuring the findings of our latest statewide survey of Californians and their opinions and attitudes around education, government, and other important topics at this extraordinary time. The survey was conducted with funding from the Dirk and Charlene Capsinal Foundation, the Sobrato Family Foundation, and the Stewart Foundation. We'd like to thank them for their support of this work. I understand that, uh, that some of the members of those foundations uh, are on, uh, on the call with us today. And thank you for joining us. Uh, for, day, for today's program, my colleague Alyssa Dykman will walk you through some of the key findings of the survey. And her, after her presentation, I will share a few of my takeaways. And then uh, we look forward to answering your questions and hearing your comments um, about the findings. If you have a question, please send an email to the email address on the screen. Um, or even if you have a comment, send it along. Um, PPIC event questions at gmail.com. We would appreciate you including your name and organization along with your question. I'd, I'd now like to introduce Alyssa, who is a research associate at PPIC and my colleague at PPIC uh, and led the project for this survey. Thank you, Alyssa. Hi, Mark, and thank you all for joining today. Give me one second as I navigate our presentation. Great. So again, thank you, Mark. And before we begin, I just like to acknowledge my co-authors of this report, which of course include Mark, uh, but as well Dean Bonner and Rachel Lawler. So this survey is the 16th in PPIC's annual Californians in Education Survey Series. For those unfamiliar with the PPIC statewide survey, its mission is to provide timely, relevant, nonpartisan data on political, social, and economic opinions, which we help will inform and improve state policymaking, raise awareness, and encourage discussion. Since 1998, PPIC has given a voice to more than 350,000 Californians in more than 180 general, regional and issue specific, such as K-12 education, which is what we'll be looking at today. So the survey was conducted online using Ipsos's Knowledge Panel sample, which is a random probability sample. The survey was conducted from April 1st to the 9th in either English or Spanish, depending on the respondents preferences, and included over 1600 California adults and about 1,100 of those who we deem likely to vote. This also included 377 parents of children 18 years or younger and 272 public school parents, uh, which includes both traditional public schools as well as public charter schools. The margin of error was 3.3% for our all adults, 3.7 for our likely voters, 6.7 for parents, and 7.8 for public school parents. So we have two main sections of the report. Uh, the first section looks at perceptions and attitudes of K-12 issues, and the second looks at funding and policy preferences. To start off though, uh, we'll be looking at something that has affected our households, local communities, and really the world, which is the novel coronavirus or COVID-19 pandemic. Um, in fact, more than eight in 10 Californians say their lives have been disrupted a lot or some by the coronavirus outbreak. Now diving into our other COVID-19 related findings, when asked how worried they are when it comes to themselves or someone in their family getting sick from the coronavirus, about eight in 10 adults and public school parents say they are very or somewhat worried. 
As you can see on the second figure to your left, public school parents are much more likely than adults to say they are very worried, uh, that 56 to 41 percent. Regionally, the share of those who say they are very worried ranges from a high of 46 percent in Los Angeles to a low of 33 percent in Orange County, San Diego. Across racial ethnic groups, Latinos are the most likely to say they're very worried, with six in 10 saying this, compared to four in 10 Asian Americans, three in 10 whites, and two in 10 African Americans. Similar shares say they are very or somewhat worried that the coronavirus will have a negative impact on themselves or their personal finances of their family, with about eight in 10 holding this view. Again, we find public school parents are much more likely than adults to say they are very worried. Across the state's regions, again, we find Los Angeles residents the most likely to say they are very worried, which is not too surprising as they have the most number of COVID-19 cases and hospitalizations in the state. Among racial ethnic groups, 57% of Latinos 40% of Asian Americans, 29% of whites, and 23% of African Americans say they are very worried that the coronavirus will have a negative impact on their personal finances of their family. Now for both of these questions, women are somewhat more likely than men to say they are very worried, as are renters are somewhat more likely than homeowners. We also find that the share saying they are very worried decreases as education and income levels rise. Um, notably, half of Californians with annual household incomes below $40,000 say they are very worried about both of these issues. Now this slide showcases the variability in the shares of Californians saying they expect good times or bad times financially in the state during the next 12 months which more or less serves as an indicator of consumer confidence. Today we find 80% of Californians say they expect bad economic times in the next 12 months, while only 19% expect good times. At the start of the year, just for context, 49% said they had expected good times and 43% said bad times. Given the large concerns over COVID-19, um, there has been a steep drop in optimism about California's economic outlook. And in this time trend, you can also see other times when consumer confidence was low, such as the dot-com boom at the beginning of the millennium and the Great Recession in, from 2007 to 2009. However, today's sudden drop is unprecedented in the history of the PPIC survey. In fact, more than seven in 10 across parties, regions, and demographic groups expect bad times in the coming 12 months. Those in Orange County, San Diego, public school parents, college graduates, those aged 35 to 54, and California residents who are not US citizens are the most likely to say they expect bad times. Now turning to the approval of Governor Newsom's handling of K-12 public education, which has risen sharply compared to a year ago from 53% to 73% for adults and from 68% to 78% for public school parents. Today, 88% of Democrats, 76% of independents, and 49% of Republicans approve of the way the governor is handling K-12 education. Regionally, about seven in 10 or more, with those in Los Angeles the most likely to approve. Across racial and ethnic groups, Asian Americans and Latinos are the most likely to approve, about eight in 10 approve in these groups, compared to seven in 10 African Americans and two in three whites. Governor Newsom's approval of K-12 issues declines as age levels rise, with younger Californians more likely to approve than older Californians. About seven in 10 or more across income, gender, and homeowner groups also approve of the governor's handling of K-12 education. 
Now, with nearly all of Calvary's 10,000 public schools closed for in-person instruction through the end of the year, the state has asked districts to implement distance learning. Um, not surprisingly, these physical closures have caused massive disruptions to the state's 6.2 million students. Now, when asked if they approve or disapprove of the way their local school district is handling school closures because of the coronavirus, 92% of public school parents say they approve. A similar 93% of parents with children under the age of 18 in the household also approve. Nine in 10 across age, education, and income groups also approve. And notably, 94% of those with a high school education only, whose household income is under $60,000, Women and Latinos approve of local school closures. And that 94% is you know, such a rare number in survey findings, so I just wanted to point that out. While school is technically still in session, distance learning is unlikely to fully compensate for lost time. Uh, in addition, nearly half of students from low-income families do not have broadband access at home. Uh, given this reality, it will be important to address the equity implications of the shift to distance learning during the pandemic. When asked how concerned they are about providing productive learning at home, 63% of parents and 70% of public school parents say they are very or somewhat concerned. Whites are much less likely than parents in other racial ethnic groups to say they are concerned. And parents with annual household incomes under $60,000 are more likely than those with higher incomes to say they are at least somewhat concerned. Additionally, six in 10 homeowners and renters express concern about providing productive learning in their homes. Recognizing these challenges, uh, Governor Newsom actually announced a cross-sectoral partnership to support distance learning and help bridge the digital divide earlier this week. So important steps are being made towards this. Now, when asked to name the most important issue facing Californians K-12 public schools today, California adults and public school parents are the most likely to mention COVID-19 or distance learning, followed by lack of funding, concern about curriculum, large class sizes, and concerns about standards and a quality of education. COVID-19 is mentioned most often by residents of Orange County, San Diego, Los Angeles in the Inland Empire, while the top issue in the San Francisco Bay Area is a lack of funding. Central Valley residents are the most likely to mention concerns about curriculum. Across parties, Democrats are the most likely to name COVID-19 and a lack of funding, while Republicans most often name concerns about curriculum. Uh, independents cite all three of these issues about equally. And across racial ethnic groups, African Americans and Latinos cite COVID-19 as the top issue, Asian Americans name COVID-19 and lack of funding, and whites name all three of these, which were COVID-19, lack of funding, and concerns about curriculum. Now, thinking about the direction of public schools. So in the context of the coronavirus crisis, majority of Californians say the states K-12 public education system is going in the right direction, while fewer than four in 10 say it is going in the wrong direction. Uh, Californians are much more likely to say it's going in the right direction today than they were last year. And today, Democrats are far more likely than independents and Republicans to say it is going in the right direction. Majorities across region, say it's going in the right direction with those in Los Angeles the most likely to say this. Across racial and ethnic groups, Latinos and Asian Americans are the most likely to hold positive views with about seven in 10 holding the view compared to fewer African Americans and whites. Finally, about seven in 10 public school parents say the system is going in the right direction. When asked to rate the quality of local public schools from a grade of A to F, 45% uh, of adults and 53% of public school parents 
give their local schools an A or B. African Americans are less likely than other racial groups uh, to give an A or B, as you can see on the slide here. Looking across regions, positive views range from 40% in the Central Valley to 48% in the San Francisco Bay Area. College graduates and those with incomes higher than $80,000 or more are more likely than those with other educational and income groups to give a positive rating. Across parties, a slim majority of Democrats grade local schools positively compared to about four in 10 Republicans and independents. The grades for local public schools in our survey are similar to those of adults nationwide um, in comparison to a May 2019 PDK Langer Research Surgery survey. Now turning to funding for local public schools, so this slide shows a time trend on our question regarding whether Californians think the current level of state funding for their local public schools is either more than enough just enough or not enough. As you can see in the last decade, um, their the share of likely voters saying that state funding is not enough has hovered around 50 to 60%. Today, the share of likely voters saying not enough is at 55%. For comparison, 50% of adults and 55% of public school parents say it's not enough as well. Today, Democrats are much more likely than independents and Republicans to say that their local public schools do not get enough state funding. Across racial and ethnic groups, African Americans are the most likely to say the level of state funding is inadequate. Also, women are much more likely than men to say the level of state funding is inadequate. Now, a ballot measure eligible for the November 2020 ballot would tax commercial properties according to their current market value, but would not lift the 1978 Proposition 13 limits on residential property taxes, uh, creating a split role property tax system. Today, we find 53% of adults and likely voters say they would vote yes on a potential state ballot measure that would make this change and direct some of the new tax revenue to state funding for K-12 public schools. By comparison, 56% of adults and 54% of likely voters said they would vote yes when, last, when asked last April. Today, Democrats are far more likely than independents and Republicans to say they would vote yes. And across regions, San Francisco Bay Area residents are the most likely to say they would vote yes while those in Orange County and San Diego are the least likely. Across racial and ethnic groups, about six in 10 Latinos and Asian Americans say they would vote yes, compared to just under half of African Americans and four in 10 whites. About six in 10 renters and just under half of homeowners would vote yes, and the shares who would vote yes decrease as age and income levels rise. Finally, 62% of public school parents say they would vote yes. Now, one of the most surprising results of the California March primary uh, was the defeat of the other Proposition 13 uh, state bond measure, which would have authorized $15 billion in general obligation bonds for school and college facilities. Now, the last time a state school bond was defeated was several decades ago, uh, back in 1994. Subsequently, we really wanted to gauge Californians' views on a school construction bond just following the primary. And when asked if the state ballot had a bond measure to pay for school construction projects, 59% of adults and 53% of likely voters say they would vote yes. 78% uh, of public school parents say the same. By comparison, about half of adults and likely voters today say they would vote yes if their local school district had a bond measure to pay for construction projects. Um, a local bond, a school bond requires just a 55% majority to pass. 64% uh, of public school parents say they would vote yes on this local measure. 
Um, and in the California March primary, 44 of 122 local school bond measures on the ballot passed, uh, which really reflects a significant drop in the passage rates from recent elections. Now for both of these questions, strong majorities of Democrats compared to about half of independents and one in four Republicans would vote yes. Uh, majorities in Los Angeles, the Inland Empire, the Bay Area and the Central Valley say they would vote yes on both the state and local bond, uh, while under just under half in Orange County, San Diego say the same. Again, for both of these questions, Latinos are the most likely to say they would vote yes, with more than seven in 10 saying this, although majorities of African Americans and Asian Americans also say they would vote yes. Uh, just under half of whites say the same. Finally, younger Californians are more likely than older Californians to say they would vote yes, as are those with lower household incomes to be more likely those than those with higher incomes to say they would vote yes. Now, following up on the previous set of questions um, that asked whether you vote yes or no, um, these questions on this slide asked respondents whether they thought it was a good or a bad idea to issue a state or a local bond um, to pay for school construction projects at this time. Now, in the midst of a COVID-19 crisis that has deeply shaken public confidence, we find about half of adults and fewer likely voters say it is a good time for the state government to issue bonds to pay for construction projects or for local school districts to issue bonds. When it comes to a state bond, 51% of adults, 44% of likely voters, and 71% of public school parents say that it is a good idea for the state government to issue school construction bonds at this time. Majorities in Los Angeles, the Bay Area, in the Inland Empire say it is a good idea, compared to four, about four in 10 in the Central Valley in Orange County, San Diego. Now looking at local school districts issuing local bonds, we find 49% of adults, 43% of likely voters, and 64% of public school parents say this is a good idea. Majority is in Los Angeles and the Bay Area and fewer in other regions say issuing local school bonds is a good idea. Now for both of these questions, Democrats are far more likely than independents and Republicans to say, the bonds are a good idea at this time. Also Latinos, those with a high school education only, and renters are the most likely to say they're a good idea. And whites, those age 55 and older, and homeowners are the least likely to say it is a bad idea. This is across all demographic groups. Now turning to two budget proposals from the January 2020-21 state budget proposal, of which Governor Newsom has proposed K-12 spending increases for the next fiscal year. So after being read brief descriptions of two of these proposals, uh, we find solid majorities are in favor of allocating $802 million in one-time spending to pay down unfunded liabilities in the California State Teachers Retirement System, or CalSTRS, um, as well as they're in favor of allocating $950, $915 million in one-time spending to expand recruitment and development programs for teachers and staff. Majorities across regions, racial ethnic groups, and demographic groups are in favor of both proposals, um, but partisans are divided, uh, with most Democrats and independents being in favor and most Republicans being opposed. Those younger than 54 years old are more likely than older Californians to be in favor, as are more renters um, are more likely than homeowners to approve. Uh, across racial and ethnic groups, Latinos are the most likely to favor the proposals uh, compared to fewer African Americans, Asian Americans, and whites. Now, in addition to the findings already shared, I wanted to highlight some other key takeaways of the survey that we did not cover in the webinar. 
So when it comes to lower income students, eight in 10 adults and public school parents say they are concerned that K to 12 students in lower income areas are less likely than other students to be ready for college when they finish high school. African Americans and Latinos are the most likely to say this, um, that they're very concerned, um, followed by whites and Asian Americans. About one in five students in Californians K-12 schools are English language learners. Um, and we find that nine in 10 adults and public school parents think improving outcomes for English learner students is important for Californians' future economic well-being and quality of life. Across racial ethnic groups, a majority of Latinos say this is very important, followed by four in 10 Asian Americans and whites and one in three African Americans. When it comes to school teachers, Californians think they're not paid enough. Uh, six in 10 Californians and public school parents think salaries for teachers in their community are too low. Only about one in three say teacher salaries are about just right. Across regions, the share expressing the view that salaries are too low ranges from 49% in the Inland Empire to 73% in the Bay Area. Today, majorities of adults and public school parents are in favor of public charter schools uh, with support lower among Democrats than independents and Republicans. Nonetheless, six in 10 say they are very or somewhat worried about charters taking away state funding from traditional local schools. Nearly a decade after the state's adoption of the Common Core Standards, 56% of adults and 68% of public school parents say they favor Common Core. Across racial ethnic groups, Latinos are the most likely to say they favor Common Core uh, with seven in 10 saying so. Seven years after the local control funding formula was enacted, the share of Californians who have heard about it remains low. 25% uh, have heard a lot, a lot or a little of it about it. Uh, in comparison, 40% of public school parents have heard about the policy. Nonetheless, after reading a brief description, seven in 10 adults and eight in 10 public school parents favor the LCFF. Next, nearly Eight in 10 Californians say attending preschool is important to a student's success in kindergarten through 12th grade. Uh, this includes 88% of public school parents who say preschool is very or somewhat important. A strong majority of adults and public school parents think the state should fund voluntary preschool for all four-year-olds in California. Although overwhelming majorities think preschool affordability is a problem. Finally, career technical or vocational education is critical to meeting Californians' workforce needs. Uh, Californians recognize this, with nine in 10 adults saying that it is either very or somewhat important that their local public schools include career technical or vocational education as part of the curriculum. Uh, yet fewer than half of Californians think that their local public schools prepare students uh, very or somewhat well for a well-paying job in today's economy. Uh, six in 10 public school parents also hold this view. Great, so at this point that wraps up the presentation slides, um, but I'd like to remind the audience to submit any questions they may have to the email listed on the slide. Um, that's again ppiceventquestions at gmail.com. Uh, and with that, I'll turn it back now to Mark. Thank you, Alyssa. That was really interesting. And you covered a lot of ground um, with those slides in a few moments. I encourage all of you to take a look at the full report um, and see the results as well as the cross tabs and the time trends that are online for this um, annual education survey. I just want to make a few remarks um, to emphasize some things that, uh, that we saw in, in the slides and in this um, uh, this, what is our first survey since the uh, pandemic uh, crisis um, has begun. And uh, as we noted in, um, in the introduction, 
um, these are extraordinary times. And um, I think I, I want to just give you a sense of that from, um, from the perspective of the survey. I think probably uh, the number one uh, takeaway for me is just the level of worry and anxiety that there is out there in California today, which is absolutely um, um, astonishing and um, unprecedented. Those two questions on how much you worried about your personal finances and how much you worried about getting sick from the coronavirus say a lot in the sense that about three and four say that they're worried about one and worried about the other. Um, altogether, about two thirds of Californians said that, say that they're worried about both at the same time. Um, and herein lies the challenge for the everyday Californian trying to weigh both the financial consequences as well as the health consequences of what they're doing and what government is doing in response uh, to this um, at all levels. Many, many people saying that um, in, in our other survey questions that their lives have been disrupted um, as a result. And about half the people saying that, that the stress is actually causing mental health problems for them. So those are some of the, um, the unseen uh, consequences of what's going on, the level of, of stress that's out there. And um, as um, those who take uh, the pulse of the public, um, it leads to then questions about what does all of this mean and what implications does it have largely for government um, in California and then also specifically for our schools. I want to mention a couple of things in, in that regard. First and foremost, um, one of our reviewers uh, who is a former uh, research fellow at PPIC who's uh, expertise in government said that he noted in uh, reviewing the survey um, uh, uh, that uh, there was in general what he described as a rally round the flag phenomenon that seemed to be taking place in California today. We see that in a number of indicators, uh, the, 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 the rise in the governor's approval rating um, since uh, a year ago, which was phenomenal. Um, could be partly attributed to uh, performance around um, K-12 schools, but certainly an indication of, uh, of, of general support that people are feeling now for state and local leadership, because we also see that in um, the level of uh, approval that the um, legislature is receiving. And then as Alyssa mentioned, that overwhelming and very surprising level of uh, support, uh, given the controversial nature of school closures that lo local school districts are receiving around this. But uh, people are at this point giving um, state leadership and local leadership um, a lot of leeway in terms of how they respond to the public health and economic crisis that's taking place. Um, and generally giving um, our, our leaders uh, the benefit of the doubt that they know better uh, about what to do under these um, extraordinary and, and unprecedented circumstances um, than anyone else. Um, but if we uh, fast forward to a month from now, um, this is when the first tests of that rally around the flag phenomenon um, um, will, will, will come into play. And that's really going to be around the May budget revise. Um, the governor will have to go back to the drawing boards, as, as he already is, on, on the January budget proposals. Um, and think now more realistically about what the state's uh, needs are and what level of support can be provided, given uh, what we might expect from the revenues that the, face, the state will, uh, will be facing uh, not just in this quarter, but um, presumably for, uh, for several uh, quarters, uh, just based on all the indications of, of uh, how uh, severe the downturn has been. We saw that in our survey around people's sense of economic confidence, which will then play into their confidence as consumers um, in uh, our economy. But we're also seeing it in those troubling numbers that were that are coming out about um, unemployment uh, in the nation and um, 
this is a reflection of uh, the, the difficult times. And this will uh, test the depth of the level of approval. Uh, because one thing that we know from the Great Recession is that when, <laughs> when the governor and legislature start saying that, um, you know, we're going to have to cut back on things uh, that matter to you at the local level, and one of the things that matters to people a lot at the local level is schools, that um, they, the public tends to take that out in terms of approval ratings. So we'll be looking for that as we go into our uh, May survey. I also want to mention, um, <laughs> in case we uh, forget that this is an election year. 2020 is, um, it is an election year. The, the, the March primary uh, was moved up so that California could be part of the presidential primary. The November election will be, um, to most Californians, something that they will uh, turn to it to express their views um, uh, about federal leadership, but also about state and local matters in this election year. And um, what does that mean for, uh, for education funding? Well, as Alyssa pointed out, the March primary had um, many disappointments for those who were proponents of increasing uh, state funding for education. Um, the defeat of the Proposition 13 state bond measure, uh, the defeat of most of the local school bond measures, really caught a lot of people by surprise, assuming that this was going to be a Democratic primary. And in fact, it was a Democratic primary that Bernie Sanders won. And um, in this climate, um, it was difficult to, uh, to pass uh, school funding measures. So what's it going to be like in November? Um, our survey gives some indication of that um, in the, the response to those questions about um, do you support uh, state bonds? Yes. Do you think that uh, the state needs to give more funding to local schools? Yes, majority said that. Do you think now is a good time for, um, for bonds? The answer was no. And um, that um, hesitancy to, um, to, to commit more funding to schools um, may play out. Uh, in the November election, both in terms of the split role tax, uh, uh, property tax uh, reform measure that would bring more funding to schools, as well as whatever local school bonds and parcel taxes might appear um, at a time in which uh, the schools are going to clearly uh, be needing more funds, um, even more so than, um, than when the year started, given what the, the, uh, the stress is going to be on the state budget. Last but not least, um, I just want to um, think uh, with you for a moment and, and leave you with, with this um, takeaway. Um, we've never had anything um, like the school closures which are taking place um, as we speak. Um, our public school students and, and, and children around California um, typically on uh, a Thursday in April, they would be in their classes, in their schools, but they're not today. Um, they are um, working um, and learning from home. And this is a completely different circumstance from what we have seen um, uh, typically in the past. How will Californians respond to this? This is going to be very interesting. For instance, those parents who are at home, uh, including those who are answering our survey, talking about the concerns they have about uh, having a productive learning environment, how are they going to think about the value of teachers going forward uh, and the importance of making sure that teachers um, have the resources that they need um, in order to do the jobs that they do with, with perhaps uh, now a new understanding of, of the important um, um, role and the difficult role that, that teachers play every day in the lives of, uh, of public school children in California. And as, um, as we've observed some of the uh, challenges that students, particularly lower income students, have around um, uh, 
the school closures, whether it's uh, the ability to access online um, and, and other um, issues that have, have come to the forefront, um, it's going to be a test of California's political will uh, to the degree to which we are committed to improve st student outcomes, particularly among the, the large numbers of English language learners and lower income students um, across the state. Um, because many of the things have come to the forefront now, will we, um, we, will we really um, even take a, a more proactive role in making sure that, um, that we're creating more access uh, that to good educations that provide better outcomes for students um, across the economic spectrum in California today. So I leave you with those thoughts for now and um, hope that you have some questions uh, for us and really, really appreciate it, especially in these difficult times, um, having a chance to, to be here with all of you today and share these, uh, these findings with you. Thank you. So uh, let's go ahead and answer some questions um, and, 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 or make some comments in the, in the chat box that might, uh, might uh, lead to some, uh, yeah, some dialogue back and forth with us. Well, Alyssa, uh, while we're waiting for those questions uh, to come in, I'm going to ask you, um, because you've been project manager for this survey now for several years, and you're a project manager on other surveys, um, what surprised you most about the findings that came out in this April survey? Yeah, well, I'd say a couple of things. I mean, for most, the findings related to the approval of local school closures, just because of the COVID-19 outbreaking, I mean, it's so rare for us in the survey world to see such high percentages of approval. That was, you know, the 93% of parents and 92% of public school parents. Um, I'd also say sort of non-COVID related. Um, our question on whether the state's K-12 education system is headed in the right direction. Uh, today we find a solid majority say the system is going in the right direction, but last year adults were much more divided. Um, so it has increased quite a bit from last year and I believe the share of public school parents who say it's headed in the right direction um, has increased by 10 percentage points over the year. So that really just indicates to me that, you know, the share of Californians are becoming, you know, a little more optimistic about the future of K-12 schools. And that's always good to see. Mm -hmm. um, here's a question about the uh, concern among parents about providing for productive learning at home. Um, on the one hand, People say that they support their local school districts, but on the other hand, they express a lot of concern about um, what they can do in their homes. Um, yeah, how do you, how do you um, account for those two, what seems to be almost contradictory comments? Yeah, I don't really see these as at odds with one another. I believe sort of the overwhelming support for school closures indicates residents uh, and parents' opinions about actions their local and state leaders have been taking. Um, while concern for productive learning is evidently, you know, closer to home um, and more personal for people. And, you know, the concern for productive learning uh, brings up quite a few issues sort of related to student learning, such as, you know, achievement gaps um, and inequities in access to computer equipment and internet connectivity or the digital divide. Um, and continued support for distance learning programs, um, you know, are going to be crucial um, as closures continue. Um, I know my colleagues at PPIC's Education Center have done some great work on this, um, and particularly blog pieces that really highlight a lot of these topics you can check out. Mm -hmm. um, another question came in, and uh, um, that uh, I'll, I'll take this one. Um, it's about support for the split roll property tax. Roughly unchanged from a year ago, even though so much has changed in the meantime, um, we're in such a different place economically than a year ago. Um, and we're still seeing support in the low 50% range um, for a split roll property tax that would provide funding for schools. And to me, that's coming from the fact that you've got, you know, roughly 50, the mid 50s, 55% of likely voters saying that they think that um, there's not enough 
state funding for local schools. So if you mention this as an option um, for increasing state funding, um, findings very similar, it kind of, it fills that need in the same way that we see, um, at least in concept, people think, um, you know, a state school bond also filling that need um, of the 55% who say that, um, that we need more state funding for, um, for, for local schools. Um, so not, not much change in that measure yet doesn't seem to be so much, um, uh, you know, reflection of, about economic confidence. Um, of course, for that question, we didn't ask, is this a good time to make that change? We, and, and I think that that's, that was something that we learned from uh, the, the follow-up questions that we asked on, um, on, on the bonds, that, yeah, you can support this in concept, but maybe now is a time to, you know, just uh, hunker down a little bit in terms of, of, of what we plan to do. So we'll see how that uh, might play out later in the year um, as, we, as we follow uh, the, the initiative that, that appears headed for the November ballot. So I'm not seeing any other questions um, at this point. So I want to give a big thank you to Alyssa uh, and the funders of this survey. Thank you, Alyssa. And thank you to the, um, the Capsonals, the Sobratos, and, and the Stewart uh, Foundation uh, today for their support. Thanks to all of you for joining us um, uh, at this uh, first uh, virtual uh, survey briefing. If you pre-registered for this event later today, you'll be receiving a survey. And we hope you take a couple of minutes and let us know how we did. There's some questions about what it's like uh, having a virtual uh, briefing like this. And we're, we look forward to your responses as we plan for more. Please be safe, stay healthy, and have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you.